William Lane Craig not only says evolution is consistent with Christianity and the Bible, but he also says evolution is theologically neutral. The evolutionary biology is theologically neutral. It just doesn't speak to those issues. Once again, William Lane Craig is in error. Evolution is not theologically neutral. Craig's error is a result of a deeply flawed understanding of evolution. All it says is that we have these genes that mutate uh, without a view toward the benefit they confer on the host organism, and that those mutations that are deleterious uh, cause those organisms not to reproduce, but to get weeded out and to die off. And that's all. And therefore, organisms change over time as the environmental conditions and pressures change. And that's it. This is a deeply flawed understanding of evolution. First, under Craig's understanding, evolution would now be falsified, at least for many, but it isn't. No one is saying, oh, random mutation and natural selection is failing. I guess evolution is false, because that is not evolution. Secondly, under Craig's understanding, most theorists would be outside the evolution camp, but they aren't. No one is saying, you're not an evolutionist for proposing an alternative naturalistic hypothesis. This brings us to the question, what is evolution? What exactly is evolution? Because it isn't random mutations and natural selection. And it isn't any particular cause or mechanism or explanation. Because none of them are sacrosanct. What is sacrosanct? Let's go back a few slides. No one is saying, you're not an evolutionist for proposing an alternative naturalistic hypothesis. So long as you propose a naturalistic hypothesis, you're within the evolution camp. But everyone says you're not an evolutionist for proposing a non-naturalistic hypothesis. Creationists are not evolutionists. IDs are not evolutionists. Evolution is naturalism, because naturalism is sacrosanct in evolution. Not atheism, not materialism, not natural selection, not common descent, naturalism. The world must have arisen by strictly naturalistic laws and processes. That is evolution. This video explains one of the many ways that evolution is naturalism. We'll start with a simple phrase. Teeth are for chewing. What is wrong with this phrase? Teeth are for chewing, that for word. That for word means there's a purpose, there's a goal, objective, reason, design, final cause, teleology. The for word carries enormous metaphysical implications. The world was designed. This was the debate between the Epicureans and the Stoics. The Epicureans said teeth are not for chewing, but rather teeth formed by chance. And because they could chew, they persisted. Now, this is kind of strange. Why would they say this? Because they believed God would not have designed this failed world from Lucretius De Rerum Natura, that in no wise the nature of all things for us was fashioned by a power divine. So great the faults it stands encumbered with. Consequently, for nothing has been engendered in our body in order that we might be able to use it, it is the fact of its being engendered that creates its use. So according to the Epicureans, teeth are not for chewing. Teeth cannot be for chewing because the world wasn't designed. The world must have arisen by random motion, that is, randomly swerving atoms. The theory entailed metaphysics. I mean, no one would say, oh no, uh, Epicureanism is theologically neutral. It just talks about swerving atoms. Well, yes, it talks about swerving atoms, but that's because of the metaphysics. That explanation of how the world arose is motivated and constrained and driven by the metaphysics. This is a metaphysical theory. It entails metaphysics. It entails theology. You can't just decouple the explanation from the greater thought. The Epicureans were opposed to design. 
They were opposed to teleology, opposed to final causes. What about evolution? It's the same thing. Nothing can be more hopeless than to attempt to explain this similarity by utility or by the doctrine of final causes. Charles Darwin, 1859, utility. One of his strong arguments, God would not create disutility. All of the species would be perfectly adapted. God wouldn't do it that way. The theory entails metaphysics. We cannot believe that the same bones in the arm of the monkey, the foreleg of the horse, the wing of the bat, and the flipper of the seal are of special use to these animals. We may safely attribute these structures to inheritance. This is the utilitarian argument from imperfections. Like the problem of evil, God would not have created disutility. The theory entails metaphysics. In chapter 6, Darwin states his theory entails the utilitarian doctrine, and its failure would be absolutely fatal to my theory. Darwin and his theory required theological utilitarianism to be true. There is no way to understand the rise of evolutionary theory in the Enlightenment except in the context of an anti-teleology derived directly from Lucretius, John Rees. The theory entails metaphysics. For the teleologist, an organism exists because it was made for the conditions in which it is found. For the Darwinian, an organism exists because out of many of its kind, it is the only one which has been able to persist in the conditions in which it is found. T. H. Huxley, 1871. Far from imagining that cats exist in order to catch mice well, Darwinism supposes that cats exist because they catch mice well, mousing being not the end but the condition of their existence. This is classic anti-teleology. Let's go back to Lucretius. For nothing has been engendered in our body in order that we might be able to use it. It is the fact of its being engendered that creates its use. For the Darwinian, an organism exists because out of many of its kind, it is the only one which has been able to persist in the conditions in which it is found. The same thing. Classic anti-teleology. This is not a scientific result. This does not come from the empirical data. The theory entails metaphysics. Let's move forward to August Weissmann. Uh, he was a Darwinian following Darwin. The effect is one way. Germ cells produce somatic cells and are not affected by anything the somatic cells learn or therefore any ability an individual acquires during its life. Genetic information cannot pass from soma to germplasm and on to the next generation. Biologists refer to this concept as the Weissman barrier. This idea, if true, rules out the inheritance of acquired characteristics as, a as proposed by Lamarck. Weissman and the evolutionists were certain this was true. You see the arrow there. The germ cells feed information to the somatic cells. There is no reverse arrow. The Weissman barrier. This is the Weissman barrier. No reverse arrow. Not allowed. So what? Weissman, 1904. Without having to call to our aid any supernaturally intrusive force on the part of the Creator. God must be distanced. God should not be intervening, should not be designing things in the world. This is theology. The theory entails metaphysics. The reverse arrow was a sign of design, a sign of purpose, of goals, of final causes, of teleology. The modern synthesis explicitly rejects the possibility of inheritance of acquired characteristics, or Lamarck. The reverse arrow was not allowed. That would be tantamount to allowing a supernaturally intrusive force. This is anti-teleology. God doesn't create the details of the world. God is distanced. The theory entails metaphysics. Evolution is not theologically neutral. Once again, Craig. The evolutionary biology 
is theologically neutral. No, it is not theologically neutral. But there is a problem. Evolution needs teleology. Here is a classic letter from Conrad Waddington to the journal Nature where he explains, we need Lamarck. We need the inheritance of acquired characteristics because otherwise natural selection working on chance mutations isn't going to work. In other words, random mutations plus natural selection is inadequate and we need the reverse arrow to explain life. Evolution could never lose the teleology and Waddington would be proven prescient. Let's look back at H.H. Lane 1923 in this chapter on the fact of evolution. He writes, thus the vertebrate eye was a favorite object for discussion on this view. But the truth is that as a mechanism for receiving and recording images of the external world, it is so imperfect that were a camera maker to try to sell such an imperfect product, he would soon find himself without a market. Any eye specialist can point out numerous ways in which the structure of the eye, wonderful as it is, might be improved to serve better its assigned function. Its assigned function? So the vertebrate eye has an assigned function. That is teleological. So Lane argued against teleology from utilitarianism and yet appealed to teleology in the same paragraph. The evolution literature is full of these absurdities. It is full of unintended appeals to teleology. Tetrapods and fish have adapted distinct CPS enzymes, what? To initiate the ornithine urea cycle. That is teleological. I further suggest that genetic code emerged, what? To avoid this randomness. These snakes evolved small heads to probe eel burrows. The lens array is designed to minimize spherical aberration and further optimized. Nature probably uncovers new topologies in order to fulfill new functions and optimizes existing topologies to increase their performance. Molecular evolution uses domains as building blocks and these may be recombined in different arrangements to create proteins. Leap roaches evolved to do what grasshoppers do. Scientists believe the harp sponge has evolved this elaborate candelabra-like structure in order to increase the surface area. It makes sense that we evolved mechanisms to protect ourselves. Natural selection has fashioned wings for flight, fins for swimming, and legs for walking. Animals and plants have convergently evolved multi-layer based photonic structures to generate colors. Wings began to evolve for display and camouflage, and then finally to allow the dinosaurs to fly. The surprising result of our study is that electric fish seem to use the same genetic toolbox to build their electric organ. Did you know that fish have a toolbox? Right now I'm down in the Florida Keys with my 7th grade class for a life science field trip. We're on an island dedicated to marine education and have had several presentations on adaptations in organisms and evolution. One of the things that struck me is how the staff can't help but speak of evolution as if it had a mind and had a goal to work towards. They actually use the terminology decided when speaking of some aspect of evolution. Evolutionist Neil Schumann. So what do we learn by looking at 600 million years of animal history? Evolution's tinkering with mammalness to make whales. In the same way, it's tinkering with fishiness to make tetrapods. And it's tinkering with animalness to make all the different body plans that we see. So what did we learn? Evolution is tinkering with mammalness to make whales. It's tinkering with fishiness to make tetrapods. It's tinkering with animalness to make all the different body plans that we see. This is all teleology. Across the tree of life, organisms have evolved a wide variety of strategies to facilitate the colonization of new environments. I love that. Strategies. They've evolved strategies. 
To adapt to extreme environments, organisms often evolve an array of highly specialized phenotypes. To adapt. A target of selection. A target of selection. Targets of selection. This is all teleology. So here is the irony and the problem. Evolution was rejecting teleology, yet simultaneously relying on teleological language. But all the while, organisms really are teleological. Organisms have a reverse arrow. The Weismann barrier is false. The reverse arrow is real. Organisms have adaptive mutations and epigenetics. This was discovered no thanks to evolution. Directed adaptation mechanisms serve to feed back information from the environment to the germ cells and future progeny. Exactly what evolutionists rejected and denied. Evolutionists said the environment could not influence DNA. Then they said it could not be transmitted to progeny. Then they said that such transgenerational information could not be passed robustly. All false. When most biologists hear the name Lamarck or the term soft inheritance, the reaction is, oh my God, here we go again, Richard says. But from a molecular biology point of view, there is a mechanism to do soft inheritance. An epigenetic inheritance can be construed as a form of soft inheritance. That's all I'm saying. The really heretical thing to say is that the environment could be pushing the epigenetic information in a direction that is beneficial. This is the more extreme variation of soft inheritance that raises the hackles. Well, it turned out to be true. This is theological. Lamarck and Lamarckian ideas were not only ignored, but actively ridiculed during the second half of the 20th century. Well, I would add before that as well. The reasons I think we're talking about replacement rather than extension are several. The first is that the exclusion of any form of acquired characteristics being inherited was a central feature of the modern synthesis. In other words, to exclude any form of inheritance that was non-Mendelian, that was Lamarckian-like, was an essential part of the modern synthesis. What we are now discovering is that there are mechanisms by which some acquired characteristics can be inherited and inherited robustly. So it's a bit odd to describe adding something like that to the synthesis. A more honest statement is that the synthesis needs to be replaced. Ever since Darwin and the Neo-Darwinians came to dominate the interpretation of evolutionary theory and its history, Lamarck has been ignored, misrepresented, and stereotyped. Finally, a burgeoning set of studies has resurrected the once heretical idea that ancestral environments can affect future generations. The challenge to Neo-Darwinism comes not from the existence of epigenetic inheritance, but from the possibility that epimutations are directed rather than random. That breaks the Weizmann barrier. I will therefore commit heresy and concede that there is a sense in which epigenetics allows the inheritance of acquired characters and that the characters thus inherited can increase the adaptiveness of an organism to its environment. Because of the apparent teleological nature of his theory, Lamarck's theory was considered for 200 years to be completely wrong. This is all theological. The theory entails metaphysics, but the teleology became real. Much as Lamarck suggested, changes in the environment literally alter our biology, and even in the absence of continued exposure, the altered biology expressed as traits or in the form of disease is transmitted from one generation to the next. These data show that epigenetic inheritance is ubiquitous. If organisms do actually demonstrate teleological mechanisms, then what about the teleological language evolutionists have been falsely using? Here is an example of genuine language. The provocative possibility that mutations might be targeted specifically to genes in which a mutation could relieve the stress. In other words, directed adaptation. You have an environmental challenge and mutations are targeted 
to help with that challenge. This is genuinely teleological language. So here is a paper that used teleological language without indicating the sense. So what do they mean? Our experiment uncovered a set of primary functional targets of high temperature. So in other words, the high temperature environment had targets, mutations that were targeted. The targeting. Selection may ultimately target. RNA Paul complex was an obvious target. Proteins that regulate the RSS, which had been identified previously as a target of selection. So they are using teleological language that can be interpreted as genuine. Okay, so finally, Robert Hazen goes there. Hazen and his co-workers are now calling for a new natural law, a very different natural law, because this natural law creates teleology. We propose that an additional, hitherto unarticulated law is required to characterize familiar macroscopic phenomena of our complex evolving universe. Accordingly, we propose a law of increasing functional information. The ID folks are going to love that. But the second law doesn't explain why things evolve, why life emerges from non-life. You look around and you see flowers bloom and trees blossom and birds sing. It seems like all of those things are counter to the idea of disorder. In fact, it's a kind of ordering of nature. We think there's a missing law, a second arrow of time that describes this increase in order, and we think it has to do with an increase in information. There almost seems to be, can I use the word purpose? I'm not sure where this will go, but give Hazen credit for recognizing and admitting to the problem. So I guess teeth really are for chewing. Religion drives science and it matters.